we're speaking with Dr. Marcelo Matos from Brazil. He's an oral maxillofacial radiologist. He's also a TMJ specialist. They have a specialty in Brazil. And he was a head author in a paper uh, that he and his mentor, and I believe his mother, perhaps, another dentist, put together. Yes, yes. Right? Uh, my mother and also another dentist from, from Argentina. Actually from yeah. Venezuela, but lives in Argentina. Right. So this is exciting stuff because we've added uh, the Loretta decompression test to the uh, neural occlusion screening protocols, which if you don't know this, this relates to how we vet and diagnose TMJ patients, their problems, occlusal problems, things like that. So the BioEMG um, equipment is available through Bio Research Associates out of Wisconsin. And look, Marcelo is going to be showing us how we can use the EMG to help get an idea if something's wrong orthopedically with the joints. Now, it can't be used in a vacuum. You have to also apply imaging, you know, CBCT and or MRI, ideally MRI as well, to really get an understanding of what's going on here, but it's a start. It gives you an idea, helps you figure out a good vertical, helps you figure out if the muscles aren't in the right place relative to the three-dimensional position of the mandible, et cetera. So um, for those of you who don't have the equipment, I highly encourage you to get it. It's not that expensive, and I've been using it for over a decade. It's quite reliable and very accurate. So, and there's lots and lots of research out there about it. And Marcelo, uh, please take it away from, for us, please. Oh, hey, thanks, Nick. Uh, it's an honor to be here talking to everybody. I see some, I think some people that I know and some others that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And well, that's, that's a very interesting topic, talking about the Loretta decompression test. Loretta, Dr. Jorge Loretta from Argentina, my mentor in the TMJ pathology field. He has been working on this test since the 90s, I think since the 92 or three or something like that. And around, the, around 2010, I think, I said to, I, I was in a, in a, in a meeting, in a dental meeting, and I saw some colleagues doing some, something similar, but lacking some, some understanding uh, in terms of interpretation. So I decided to, I took, I, I decided to, to publish that. I talked to Dr. Ray, said, oh, let's publish the, the, that paper. And since we had to hurry up to publish that paper, it's just based on some case analysis, but basically the, the reader understand the logic behind it. So what is the logic behind it? Well, when we talk about TMJ pathology in actually any kind of, the da of damage inside the joint, we're talking about orthopedic position of the mandibular in relation to the cranium. Uh, and that is something that's not only biomechanical, but neurophysiological. It's easy to understand that if we think about the knee if you put the knee in a bad position, how long can you stay in that position? Usually for a short time until your nervous system finds a way to move your knee in terms of uh, nociception and proprioception. You're going to move looking for a comfortable position. And you're doing that, you're going to do that using your muscle. So you have your, the input, the original input from the joint telling to the central nervous system that something is not good in the knee example basically the position and the the central nervous system is going to to give back okay i, I think i was muted <laughs> so the bottom line is there is going to be a motor response to correct that position, looking for a, a, a more comfort, comfortable one. And scientifically speaking, the more comfortable one would be with less nociception, the optimized proprioception in terms of biomechanics. The same applies to the, the TMJ. So when we think about that vertical relation or well, vertical dimension, as we say uh, usually in the clinical environment, say, okay, let's work this vertical dimension of this patient. The patient has brushed it, has worn down the teeth, let's rebuild it, let's do a full mouth reconstruction. Okay, but if all this 
is related to vertical dimension. But we must think, think that vertical dimension is not only a, a visual analysis. For example, we let me share my screen a little bit. We usually think when we talk about vertical dimension. Uh, okay, something's going wrong with the sharing. Okay, now I saw one of them. So this, this is Dr. Jorge Labreta. I think this picture has kind of five or six years or something like that. And uh, he's from Argentina and he's the guy who's been working on these tests for a, a while. And it, this is part of uh, our screening process that to make it easier, we make our way the temporal mandibular pathology screening, TPS. But when you are screening the patient, you are not only using the EMG or not using, only using, using uh, anamnesis, you are not only using uh, physical palpation, you are combining stuff, you are combining all the tools, the tools. So usually when we think about vertical dimension, we think about this in terms of conventional dentistry. We look, we look to the mouth looking for uh, an upper arch covering the lower arch to some extent. But if we think about that, we don't have any information, any data on the health status, status or the pathologic status of the system. A person may have this occlusion relationship and be very healthy, or maybe the person is very pathologic in terms of joint, but how to know that? So for that, you need imaging, MRI, CBCT as the fundamental imaging to study that. But let's say you have two cases and both cases has similar images. How that same problems affects the individuals? The individual A may have more symptoms and more changes in their, uh, the way they function their muscles and the individual B may not. How to test that? And how to understand the vertical dimension, not from a visual aspect as we usually do, do, we usually do this kind of stuff. We see the, the, the relation and say, we say, okay, there's an overbite or there's an open bite, but okay, this is a, a visual analysis. And how about measuring? And I'm not talking about how many millimeters the person have here, but in terms of function to have a glimpse about the healthy or pathologic status. This is where the EMG jumps in. You, you, you have to use the EMG to do that because at the same, the same way as I was talking about the knee joint that you may put in an uncomfortable position. And sooner or later, you're gonna to have to change the position to get a more comfortable one. And you're gonna use the muscle to do that in response to neurological inputs. So once we have the EMG over the muscle, we can understand a little bit what is going on. And that's the idea. So in this, in this uh, screen here, you can see a conventional dynamic EMG having rest. Can you see my, my, my arrow, Nick? Okay, so in this area here, we have the rest, the rest, uh, uh, first I almost say, like say five seconds of the recording, have the, the rest period. Then we ask the patient to open wide the mouth, then to clench hard, very hard, over four to five seconds, then relax and swallow. So we have a glimpse of how this person can recruit the muscles, the closing muscles, the opening muscles, but this is not enough. This is not all we can do to the, with the EMG. Let's say this person fires around uh, 80, 80 microvolts. It is good or bad? Depends. The, per the person is capable of fire, fire. 300, it's only fighting 80. It means that most of the muscle is not working during its job. What is the job of a massacre? Close the mouth. So how to understand 
what is the capacity of that particular muscle of, for that particular person. That's where the understanding of how it is in Portugal. So if it was someone there understand a little bit of Portuguese, <laughs> and so when I'm from Brazil, Brazil speak Portuguese, but also people who speak Spanish may have some understanding of the Portuguese. So here we have nosception. It's a very similar word as in English. Thinking about compression in uh, any kind of uh, irritation of uh, nociceptive stimulus in terms of local aspect, the joint itself. So it's going to take the fibers, the A delta and the fiber C, bringing the, taking the, the, the input to the central nervous system and getting back the reflex through the motor system. There is where the EMG jumps in. So the problem with the EMG is that you have you 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 cannot have a, a, a cut point as you have, for example, for blood analysis. If there is there is a number, you will get positive to a specific test or negative to a specific test. So there is a person finding a muscle just like this. And I need to understand if this is good or not for that particular person. How we do that? So we take a step further and we apply the, the test that you, that you can see in the paper. Uh, I think Nick have, had sent it before in, in anticipation for you all. So this is the same pictures of the, the, the paper, the original one. We're going to make the patient clinch hard for about four to five seconds following this sequence, conventional occlusion, whatever you call it, maximal occlusion, uh, uh, habitual occlusion, the natural occlusion of the patient. Just clinch hard, as hard as you can. That's the problem. So after that, you pause the, the EMG system, you put a cotton roll at the right side, in this position, over premolars and molars, you resume the recording and you ask the patient, clinch hard, 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 during four to five seconds. You must be uh, take care of the way you talk because you say, clinch hard, 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 the patient will do <laughs> following your comment. So keep a, 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 a nice comment and do the same to the left and to the same, do the same to both sides right and left. What that means? What this, actually this test does? What happens when we clinch hard? Does everybody agree that we put a lot of pressure over the teeth and over the joint, right? So we have the muscle fighting this direction and you have all the pressure here and here. Assuming the teeth are not damaged, let's say with something that is giving pain or preventing the person to apply force because of teeth pain, let's say uh, a problem with a prosthodontics, uh, a broken crown, an uh, inflamed root or something like that. To, to have, in order to, to have a nice analysis of the cultural test, you need to have, uh, to, cons to consider that the teeth is not giving you, giving you a a bad nociceptive input and changing the recording. So let's say the person has a, 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 a nice occlusion just as the picture you saw, and the person is clenching, so you have the muscle fighting this direction. We all know there's many other muscles working at this uh, moment. Some as the trigoidal or the, the middle one, you do something very similar to the masseter, but there are other muscles that are stabilize the system but this is not important this, at this point because we're not recording the other muscle. We have the, cotter, the, the EMG over the temporal, over the masseter, you have the, 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 ga, the gastric. I uh, almost couldn't, couldn't ex, expel that. Maybe it's, it's like a little bit of wine, so it's Friday. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. Half hour <laughs> after wine, the job could be easier. But uh, anyways, once the, 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 the pressure is there, if there's something bothering inside of the joint, what do you think the central nervous system tells the muscle to do? Keep clenching, keep fighting, 
or yeah. it's gonna limit the muscle in order to protect the joint. It's gonna limit the muscle. So we have the, the, the nonception here, we have the, the, all the pressure that the muscle is capable of uh, apply force there. So then we repeat the test with the cotton roll. Now, once the muscle is fighting, there is more space there. You are preventing the condyle to get completely into the deep, into the fossa. Once there is less movement of the condyle in terms of compression of the joint, either to the, the, the roof of the fossa or to the back of the fossa, no matter if there's less pressure there because the cotton wool is absorbing part of, the, the, of this pressure, this, the nonception gonna be lower and the muscle gonna be allowed to fire, to fire more. So this is the logic behind it. As you can see, in this case, the patient is clenching hard with apparently nice occlusion or at least not so bad. But take a look what happens when the person clenches over the right cotton roll. The muscle fires. In the left cotton roll, it fires. In both cotton roll, even better. So what's going on here is that these muscles are inhibited. It's not because this, this typically when a patient has a muscle just like that, it's typically the patient who come, come into the office with a lot of facial pain. And sometimes you think about hyperactivity. This is not hyperactivity, this is hyperfunction. Hyperactivity. And how about DTR? No, in DTR you're talking about hyperactivity because you're talking about excursive movements. And during excursion, you don't want the, 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 this muscle fighting uh, extremely while you're touching back teeth that you should not be touching when you are having those excursive movements. So, during that excursive movement, the muscle that was not supposed to be fighting that, that much, it's fighting, okay, that's hyperactivity. But this no, the muscle are supposed to make you crush the food. It's like a, a weight, a weight lifting, weight lifter, lifting a huge amount of weight and asking the muscle to do the job. The muscle are doing the job, lifting the weight. But if you create any damage to the, the, the shoulder, and that damage is going to prevent the muscle to fire properly. The same lifter is going to have trouble. Is going to have trouble to put the the, the, the weight overhead because the muscle is going to be inhibited by the lesion. And that's interesting because there are going to be muscles that are going to be hyperactivated. Which muscle? Usually the muscle that do the opposite. The muscle that decompress. In this case, it is not happening. That's why we put the diagnostic here, because in some cases, it's going to fire just like crazy here. And when you put the cotton roll, it's going to just slow down. And th this is going to give us more and more information about us, what is going on there. So think about this test. Now you can see why the person during clinch is not, uh, is not properly working. A muscle, a muscle, for example, that we, we, we learn from dental school that was on, on one of the most powerful muscles of the body. But this person here is clenching hard in the masseter, barely can, can fire. So, uh, think about that. I'm going to show something combined. Can I ask a question real quick? Of course. So, let's say you've got a right cotton roll on your right posterior teeth. You are decompressing the right joint, correct? Correct. Now, but what's also at to some extent the left one? Right. So, can you help us understand right from left? In other words, so right side cotton roll, I'm decompressing my right joint tremendously, but it's all one bone. So, I'm, you know, what's going on with the left? What do you okay. say? This is the tip of the iceberg. Because if we go deeper on cotton roll test, the, the rate of decompression test, we can talk for like one day or two. <laughs> yeah. But let me show some pictures first, and then I get back to your question. Could it be? Okay. Once we talk about the logic behind the test, take a look at these pictures here. Here's a EM, uh, MRI and an EMG of, with the cotton roll test. You can see, we can see that the right 
the right TMJ is completely damaged. There is a complete necrosis of the bone marrow. Both images, both sides, are proton density images. So you can see that the, with the semi parameters, the left side, you can see the, the cortical bone. You can see, actually, the cortical bone is what we are not seeing because the cortical bone has very low concentration of hydrogen. So it gives actually a hypo signal. But anyways, a part of radiological, radiological details, uh, we can, we can um, this is the, the, the cortical. Here in hyper signal, like more as a white, you can see the bone marrow. And here, no bone marrow. Why? Because this is a complete necrosis of the bone marrow. We can see that the disc is completely damaged. We have only part of the frontal aspect of the disc and only part of the uh, posterior band of the disc. The right side, the left side of the patient, which is in my right side, in the right side of my screen, is much, much better shape. So see what happens here. The patient is clenching, but the right masseter almost can't fire. The left one fires in such a way that it seems a nice recruitment, but you can see at the position three and four, left quarter row and bilateral quarter row, you can see that there is a position that it fires much better. But look at the right masseter. And this starts to answer a little bit what you ask, Nick. With the cotton wool at the right side, the compression over this extremely damaged joint is a little bit reduced. So the system allows the muscle, the, the system, I mean the central nervous system, allows the muscle to fight much better, as you can see here. But take a look at both sides can fire. But when we apply the same principle to the left side, the left side go up, goes up can find much more, but the right side can't because the mandible in this case is unbalanced. You have no, there's no teeth touching because the cotton roll is between the teeth at the left side and the right side is in the air. But there is a, can you see, can you see myself here or only my, 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 my slide? See both. Okay. Imagine that my hand here is the mandible. My fingers are the condyles and here are the, the teeth, the cotton roll is on one side and the patient is clenching. This cotton roll functions as a stop and the other side does this, while the cotton roll holds the main roll here and the other side is doing this, mm -hmm. like this. The one side is protected, the other side is not protected. That is my, not two hands here. Uh, one side protects the cotton roll, the other side no cotton roll, and the main does this. If this cannot support, it's gonna go down again. With both, both cotton rolls, you have more balanced situation. But it, uh, it's not only joint. There, is case, there are cases where you have tendonites. You have the temporal tendonites, you have, the, you have a masseteric tendonites. In this case, by the joint, you can apply force, but the muscle cannot apply force because the connection to the bone is inflamed. You got that? So when you see some, something that is not congruent in, the, in this test, you go clinically and try the insertion of the muscle to see if there is uh, important or severe uh, tendonites, not the belly of the muscle, but the not the belly of the muscle, but the tendons. Take a look at this other case here. Both sides very damaged. You can see both sides with a very extremely displaced disc with loss of its shape. And there's something going on in the condyle here. It seems as the cortical, it's very uh, uh, thick, but it's actually is not a, a cortical that is thicker, but the subchondral bone just under the cortical bone is getting necrotic. So it's not giving enough hyper signal to generate the image you should see. It gives the same kind of image as the cortical. 
in which look and think that is uh, uh, more uh, thicker cortical, but it is not. This is the generation going, going on. Any, in, anyway, in both cases, right and left, the situation is not a nice situation to sustain force. So take a look what happens here. The masseters during clenching are fighting much less than temporals. Imagine that the temporals, it can, uh, the temporals are supposed to apply force, but they are much more direct to final motor coordination, while masseter apply the extreme force after the temporal have position at the navel. But take a look to, to the cotton at the right side, then the left, then both sides. And here we can see that there are differences between right and left. It means that the vertical dimension needed in this case is different from the right side to the left side. What's easy to understand because the, the amount of damage in both sides are different. A very healthy disc in a man may, may be as thick as eight millimeters. Most of the time you're gonna see between six and eight. In women, a little bit less. So with this disc that at the posterior band would be almost uh, seven, let's say, let's say seven as an average. And it's out of place in this condyle is deeper in the fossa. And this is, this process is happening at this other side, but in a different extent. So it's easier to understand from that, from a three dimensional perspective, the minimal is not well aligned to the cranium. And this is gonna be gonna reflect on, on, on the cultural test. But the cultural test they may be uh, let's say affected by other by other vari variables. Like like I said, if the teeth are having trouble to sustain compression, it's gonna affect the test. If there's no teeth, no test. If there's lack enough teeth, problem with the test. If you have uh, maladapted prostodontics, you're going to have trouble with this test. And what if you decompress, the central nervous system gives the order to fire much more, but the muscle has not the correct fuel, fuel to fire. That's when systemic problems jumps in. And for example, we can use some blood analysis to screen this kind of patient. And those kind of patients are usually those that are, are very refractory to treatment. You, all those patients with a, 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 a multiple treatment, sometimes treatment sim, similar to, to those that we do and never has the nice response, the nice response we all expect. Think about systemic. This patient may have problem with insulin, with uh, metabolism of carbo carbohydrates. Think about what's the basic fuel of the muscle, gly glycogen. And if there is no glycogen or if the metabolism of glycogen is somehow affected, you're going to have trouble with that. Some muscle relaxants and some drugs also affect. So it's a very interesting test because it gives you an uh, uh, in alert, in, in alert of many things that may compromise the treatment we are thinking about offering to the patient. So this is a positive cultural test. Let's see if there is other case here. Another positive one. See, according to tomography, uh, uh, MRI, and you can see another case, a complete necrosis of the condyle head. The, why I say necrosis? Because in MRI, we are looking to the signal that comes from the lipids of the living bone. Once the, the living bone, the cells are damaged and we have a sclerosis, we're gonna have more mineral and it's gonna show in the MRI as a necrosis and in the cognitive tomography as a sclerosis, hyperdensity. That's in a T1 in, MRI, right? This is a T1 MRI. Yep. T1 MRI. But back to the EMG, this is the right side, right side affected, 
same situation as the, 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 the other one. Right cutter roll, left cutter roll, both sides. In, in this case, the left cutter roll, it generates an inhibition of the opposite side, even bigger than the original one. It means that when it, it, uh, the stabilization of the mandible in a position unstable, with the stop only at one side, in this case, on the left side, it is very complicated to the mandible of the other side, who has no teeth to also support the mandible on the joint to hold that situation. And the muscles are not supposed to fire that way. And they see the, the, in order to not damage, do not create any more damage in the central nervous system, just turn down that muscle. And actually just seconds later, the cutter both sides, boom, firing again. So thinking about the person, how many of you have taken an airplane flight for over six hours? What happens to the to, to our legs when you're uh, flight and uh, having a flight, a very a very a long flight? Is the muscle comfortable or uncomfortable? Usually uncomfortable. Even there are people who has uh, the, the, the water re retention and other problems in the legs. So the leg is not properly firing, less blood flow, less oxygen. Most of the time this is happening. Hypoxia, wouldn't you say that's part of the reason people have the temporal tendonitis? The message? Yes, also, but the temporal tendonitis, you can have it because of, uh, let's say, Dr. Rita calls that actual problem. You have to problem to properly find the, the position of the minimal in terms of, of horizontal plane. And for example, when you apply a DTR or a MAG, and you take off those. Uh, those interference and allow the manual to just close and close, not close and have to adjust a thousand times before closure. You eliminate many, many, many cases of tendonites. But you have tendonites that are autoimmune and you have tendonites that are uh, for infection. For example, one of most known uh, the feature on rheumatic disease are enterocytes that are inflammation of ligaments, tendons, and joint capsules. So that's the point. Anyways, we could, if we are hitting 30 minutes, 33 to be exactly, and that was the idea, show a little bit of the test and the potential to give us yeah. data on how to work. Of course, I'm limiting these to the joint in this case here, I'm not showing all the other, for example, we're not, I'm not showing the, the situation of occlusion or blood analysis, but the point is to get the idea. The muscle are supposed to fire, to fire and apply force over the, the, the teeth, generating pressure to break and smash the food. That was why the masseter and temporalis were, was created. So, of course, it works for the reason we, we, when we talk, most of the coordination, final motor coordination of the manual is done by the, the temporalis. But the bottom line is it has, or they, the muscle, have to apply force during clinch. So, when I see someone using appliance to reduce the, the contraction and say it's muscle relaxation, it's craziness because you are actually inhibiting a muscle to, uh, to do its job. Oh, Marcelo, but the, the, the patient is a clinch at night. That's another issue. Clinch during night is another topic. It's yeah. not this. A person may have much less than this during clinching, and during sleeping, clinching much more than this. So, that's another topic related to this, but usually uh, it's not this we are talking about. In terms of functionality during clenching, you will uh, take a bite of your beef, you wanna smash that beef and crush it to ashes <laughs> in order to eat. So your muscle must function. Your teeth must be well aligned to sustain that pressure. Any disruption to that system and the system gonna inhibit 
those muscles that apply pressure. And gonna fire the muscle that alleviates pressure. As you can see here in, in blue, the digastric being fired to limit the pressure. You see, with the cotterols, they are the, the firing of the digastric is reduced, the reduced. In this case, it is not as reduced as here, but a little bit more reduced than that. But think about something. In a case like that, if you rebuild the vertical dimension of this case at the same extent between the sides, you're going to create a problem here. You're going to correct this and create a problem here because case like this need different side to side vertical dimension. That's why I prefer to call that, uh, not only me, and actually Dr. Gareta, likes to call that three dimensional position of the main bone. So when we are, when I listen, listen, some people say, oh, let's open the bite, uh, open the vertical. I, I, I listen some say, uh, let, let's open the vertical. You cannot do that. You can recover the vertical. If you go a little bit beyond that, you also create problem. But that's me, for another another day to, to talk about, right? Let me ask a question real quick. Can you use the uh, Loretta decompression test to say decide on a uh, splint height or a let's say you're doing an all on four denture and you want to make sure that the muscles are going to be in a good place there. But you got exactly. Right? That's where we ap space. apply it most before and after tonic, for example. Yeah. If now, you have, for example, a very positive test with the cotton rolls, then you construct your orthotic and you don't get the same response from the orthotic, it means the orthotic is not properly working. It should be making the muscle, which we're talking about orthotic, not splints, orthotic, those that has anatomic features that the person can chew with it, because if not, by definition, it's not orthotic. By definition, orthotic is something that uh, optimizes function. You don't you have problem with your eyes, you have uh, glasses that optimize function. The glasses, by definition, orthotic. You have something with some issue with your feet, you put those, how call that in English? Under the feet, under the foot. Oh, like, help uh, you yeah, yeah, like inserts, help, inserts. Inserts, to help yeah. you with your balance and you with your uh, weight distribution. And you get, let, let's say, a better work, walking uh, pattern. You have an orthotic. You have some prosthodontics that has orthotic function. For example, dental prothesis. Dental work is in general, uh, let's say a prosthodontics all on four is prosthodontics and orthotic. Mm -hmm. But I speak, no, if you just hold something there and it's not optimizing anything, it's just like a, a glass eye. A person has no eye, eyeball and put those prost prosthetic eye, has no function, only cosmetic, helps nothing with the yep. visual capacity. It's just prosthetic. So theoretically, mm -hmm. you could use this for checking your orthodontic movements. You know, you can exactly. Or I can show that uh, because we are hitting forty minutes right now. So, uh, but I can I can show it, it real quick. Quick. Yeah. This is before and after. Let me share my screen. Before and after treatment. Yeah, we need to make it clear that you know the joints are two thirds of the occlusion, and any yeah. dent deals with bites. I mean, this sounds. You know, a lot of people get turned off by this, oh, it's TMD world, TMJ pathology world, whatever. No, it's not. It's everything world. It has to do with all the restoration, sure, sure. orthodontic movements, the surgical interventions. I don't care if you're doing orthognathic surgery as a surgeon. You know, this would be a great way to get an idea of where things belong. And also, I should make it clear, you should make it clear for us, the orthotics <laughs> you mentioned that were anatomic. Uh, there are times where the orthotic is going to be much taller on one side than the other, for example. For sure. Yep. With asymmetric faces because of asymmetry of the joints, yeah, you're gonna have orthotic that are completely asymmetrical. Right, and, and not... times so you have to update it periodically. You may have to check the data again, correct, and make a new one or overlay. For sure, because over time the the, the joint gonna yep. gonna change, well, whether it's adaptation or a progressive derangement, a progress progressive sure. uh, degeneration. And so, so over you, time, you're going to have to, like cars, you buy a car, you, you drive all the time, some, from time to time, have to stop to realign yep. the, the tires, the, the, how to call that in English? Uh, balance Align, and alignment. 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 
because yeah. the the all the moving parts are having some usage and gonna be affected over time by the use. Same How? applies to the joint. Let's say a person with a degenerative joint disease. Uh, it's in general, it's gonna have some small changes over time, depending of the diagnosis. If it's from autoimmune process, it's gonna have many changes over time. And think about the person that you created uh, uh, an occlusion or as uh, all in four. Mm -hmm. And you expect that to, to last forever. It mm -hmm. won't if the joint is damaged. So a quick way to check what is going on over time with the joint is the mastication analysis, as you talked about the proteins. And to check the height, if the height is actually the three-dimensional position with uh, a fox on height, this test works really, really great. But take care if there's no natural teeth, if there's only implants, and if the all four is do not extend too much to the back, only like to the first molar level. Sometimes the pressure gonna do the, gonna make the main will do this, and you won't have a very nice read of the of the of the of the the EMG because you are lacking some data aspect of the equation. Yes. Yeah, so let me ask you another quick question. How? How often would you typically be uh, changing? I know it's going to be different for every patient, but you'd have a patient back every what about three months to check to do new data gathering. In, decided in general, retarded. in general, a typical TMJ. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. But in general, the a, a typical TMJ pathology treatment uh, lasts around one year. Actually, eleven months is the 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 medium point. The mean. And I see the patient around four to six times over this, that, that time. Mm -hmm. And every, every the patient one, one uh, I, I see the patient every two months mostly. Right. So is it unusual to every two months to be adding uh, a, a new liner to say the orthotic? Or removing it. Or allowing the money more to go a little bit forward or, or, or left or right, whatever the joint is asking. And also it stabilizes. For example, you do a knee surgery. You, in general, you have six to eight, six to eight months of recovery to get back to sports. For example, after uh, anterior cruciate ligament uh, rupture, for example, for for the knee, for the for the change, change is something very similar. Um, but the time that general generally the the change ask or stabilization, recovery, or adaptation is around 11, 10 to 11 months, 10 to 12 months. So over time, there will be some small changes. Sometimes you have to change orthotics. Sometimes you have to, to realign it. Sometimes you want to realign, but you have no present. For this case here, this is initial and uh, control long after the beginning, probably at the end of the treatment. As you can see, if I try to increase the orthotic. It's the first one here. Initial in the top, control in the bottom. The first clinch, let's say like that, is conventional occlusion, right cotton roll, left cotton roll, and bilateral cotton roll. Here the patient is using orthotic. But what happens when we put the cotton roll over the orthotic? We increase the height beyond that patient needs. And you see the muscles start to get inhibition because you put the minimal in a unfirm, unfavorable biomechanical position, in a not so good uh, biomechanical position. Remember, it's neurophysiological and biomechanical. With the, the left cotton roll, you have a kind of not so different for the temporalis, but there is a inhibition of the masseters and bilaterally almost no changing from this here. The small change that may happen is because the cotton gives more area of contact instead of just uh, hard tips of the nano to touch. So anyways, if you go to the numbers, you're going to see that the numbers here are not so different from the first to the left one. That means I should not increase anything more in this 
orthotic because the the genetic length of the muscle is already there. We have to respect that because if you try to 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 push a little bit more that in that direction, you're gonna have trouble with the teeth. The teeth are gonna start to move. So have... let's say you have a a TMJ pathology patient, or let's say you're a prosthodontist, you've just done some all on fours. And let's say uh, you're having them back for a yearly recall. Would the Loretta decompression test be a very useful tool to be able to check, to make sure that the vertical is in the right place? Uh, arrangements, you know, most people that are older have got joint arrangements. Yeah. Right? Uh, for that, to, to check the alignment, we have, we, you could combine the jaw tracker with the taste, and it's easier to see what, what is the trouble with alignment. But you can use the, the, the compression test to see if there is any other kind of change in terms of uh, vertical emission. Mm -hmm. But taking, taking account that over time, we're talking about all four, and many cases, people over 50s, and remember that over time, it's natural to lose muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So yeah. consider that also. S and so, remember, in, in terms of uh, all of four, it's going to depend a little bit of the length of the uh, prosthetic, how uh, can the prosthodontics, in terms of distal. If it's too, how can I say, mesial? Mm -hmm. Too anterior. Too, mesial. too anterior. Um, it, the, 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 the EMG will be always messy. Got it. Because when I clench over the teeth, the fulcrum is going to be too much to the posterior, yeah. the direction of insertion of the muscle, and the, the EMG won't be the, the best tool to check that. As it's not the best tool to check if the person has, for example, hyperinsulinemia and uh, carbo problems. So, in summary, the Loretta decompression test would be amazingly um, efficacious to check vertical, right? Three-dimensional, three-dimensionally. We will focus on the vertical. And yeah. think about something. I use a lot of this test at the beginning to check if the patient has uh, any red flag. But mm -hmm. let's say you have a very clean damage seen on MRI. You see that it, the, the disc is very split and mm -hmm. there's no space. You expect a very positive test. And you come out with a very not expressive test. Let's say all positions are the same. This is a very big red flag. Maybe this case has something more going on or maybe it's not what is going in terms of symptoms is not the orthopedic aspect of the case. So I use that the, the, the test during the screening, not only to select good patient, but to exclude bad cases. It's yeah. very, very important for that. Very, okay. very, I, I, I can't reinforce too much how important it is to yeah. also select and exclude patients. Yeah. If I have, for example, a, 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 a false, false negative, let's say it not seems to have any height necessity, but you go to the, to the, the MRI and you see that there is a lot of damage, a lot of structural damage. And we have also have some clear problems in terms of good analysis. This is the kind of patient that even consider that the patient may say, okay, I have pain on chewing, my, my pain, my headache get worse after chew hard foods. And all this kind of is very typical of change problem. But you go with treatment and the, per, the, the, the person still have a lot of tiredness, fatigue, pain, and uh, you, you, you can't manage it very well. So these are the, those cases. So it's much better to see it before and put the patient aware of that so you can make the patient own their problem, right? And I said, this is what you got. This is not, not the best situation for those who is watching this and works with orthotic, those case that's not possible that test has a higher risk to be a bad case in terms of orthopedic treatment, in terms of, let's say, using orthotic to correct it.
It's not impossible. I have many cases with bad decompression tests that was really fine in terms of uh, treatment result. My, but during the process, we have to deal with stuff that was beyond typical things. These are those crazy cases that usually I take to, 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 the, to the meetings and stuff like that. Usually has uh, other stuff going on. So in summary, um, we need to make it clear that this is, like I said in the beginning, this is not something that you can use in a vacuum. You need to also have the other tools available. You need to learn how to read the MRI, how to order one, right? The CVCT, things like that, correct? Correct, and that's why, that's why it's interesting to people who, who like this kind of stuff, start to get involved. It may seem it's complex for a, a first glance, but actually it's, it's, very, it's very clinical stuff. So you do a time, you do a second time, you, the, the patterns start to repeat, you go, okay, that's, that's the same thing happens to the other patient. Oh, mm -hmm. well, now I'm mm -hmm. Just like that. So uh, you have the Seno courses there, you have the, the image courses at Seno, CNO3. Mm -hmm. CNO3. Have the, the, tempor the TPS at CNO4. And for who's that going to come to Brazil, we, we can have, uh, we have here uh, the, the CMJ Institute. Mm -hmm. And in Argentina, we have the, our original center. Right? It's still, still working. Dr. Dr. Loretta is still there teaching. And you, any of you are interested, it would be amazing to have you here. Enjoy some sun, <laughs> sun, beachy, uh, science, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, the symposium would be something that if people are interested to look at, um, that, was, that was fun. And that's the symposium, and we cannot forget that. Yeah. Um, it is full of amazing conference there. Yeah. Surgeons, radiologists, orthodontists, GPs, engineers, Radke, Piper. Right. I mean, Salvador, the ortho, I mean, Brian Shaw. Anyhow, look, we, we have to thank you for your time. I know it's date night. You got to go out with your wife. So um, we'll do this again sometime soon. And, and thank you all for showing up and watching and enjoying this with us. And the CNO plans on doing this. We're trying to hit it about bi-monthly. We're going to have new topics all the time. And once again, thank you, Marcelo, for being here. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate you. Take care. Night you too. Good night.